We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, and I'm a Partnerships Manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I'm excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Jordan Peace. He is the CEO and co-founder of Fringe. Jordan, how's your day going? Uh, it's going really great. Thanks for asking. I'm happy to be here. Yes, absolutely. I love your Fringe uh, t-shirt and the blue wall behind you. It's all very on brand. Um, if you <laughs> can start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns, the work you do, and this could be anything, but what has recently brought you joy? Oh, I love that question. Um, yeah, so like you said, Jordan Peace and I lead Fringe. Uh, I guess my pronouns would be him and his and uh, he. Um, yeah, I think what we were just talking about it, Christina, before we started recording, I think yeah. one thing that brings me joy is, is my kids. I have four of them, um, ages eight down to one, and they bring me a lot of different emotions, but one of them <laughs> is certainly joy. And I just love their curiosity. I love their fearlessness. I love that there's not any pretense or um, not a lot of scars from their past, thankfully, that lead them to doubt people or have any yeah. cynicism in their little hearts. You know, they're just sort of brave and curious and they go about life in such a pure way. So I love to be around them. Yeah, absolutely. They're pure and they, yeah, I mean, I bet there's never a dull moment in your house is like we were talking about. It's very active. Um, and I want to dive into your personal journey of how that's really led you to found, uh, to found and lead Fringe. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think for me, Fringe was a discovery from doing work in the financial planning world. Um, so I had financial planning kind of personal clients for a number of years, about six, seven years that I did that. And one of the topics that was always kind of just a black hole of, of discussion was like how benefits work. Um, there's so many of my clients, very intelligent people, many of them doctors and attorneys and you oh, know, yeah. CEOs of companies and so forth. And they're just like, I don't understand what max out of pocket versus a deductible is. And I don't understand when my disability insurance would apply and when it wouldn't. And it's just all kind of written in some alien language that like no one really fully understands their benefits. And, you know, it just led me to think, what if we could expand benefits to things that you, not to be <laughs> crass, but like things that you didn't, you don't have to be disabled or sick or dead or 65 years old to benefit from your benefits, right? Um, and, and so that was where this concept of like, what if we could add for quote fringe benefits that would meet daily needs in people's lives, would impact their family, their children, like in my case, um, <laughs> reduce stress, spark joy, to bring that word back into the conversation. And, and that's what we really set out to do several years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And when you have those fringe benefits or you have benefits in general too, once you deduce what they are, like you said, sometimes it's hard to understand what the what the regular benefits are there. Uh, you have happy yeah. employees and happy employees in turn, you would think like stay at a company, they do better work. And there's all these other um, kind of data points that support that as well. And yeah. I know that, you know, for, at Fringe and like you and your team believe there's the science behind happy employees. Can you share a little bit of data around, you know, proving that statement out of happy engaged employees are loyal employees? Yeah, I mean, this is something that, um, that we survey for all the time. Right. Yeah. And we, we try to get a baseline if, if companies will allow us to do that and get a baseline kind of before we get started with um, some of our clients and just understanding how satisfied they are, you know, how they feel about recommending their employer to their friends and so forth, kind of that ENPS score. Um, and then just periodically get a sense for not only how is that changing over time, but how is that changing correlating to the types of benefits that they're selecting? on our platform, which is really interesting. Um, and I think a lot of the discoveries that we've made is the more that you can personalize concepts like well-being or mm -hmm. mental health and things of that nature, the better, right? So for example, this will sound silly, but like my, my co-founder, one of my co-founders, Jason, he always says that Instacart is his mental health benefit, right? <laughs> because for him, it's not the text or talk therapy that is most useful in his life right now. It may be in the future, right? Or in the past. But for right now, just not having to load up three kids and go to the grocery store 
Right. That is a huge deal in his life, right? Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes we decide on behalf of our employees, you need mental health benefits and here's what they should be, right? As opposed to letting employees that are adults, of course, and have their own volition to discover for themselves and be a little bit more personalized in the way that we approach solutions for them. That's honestly a great example. I never thought of it from that perspective as well. And like you said, employees want different things, especially at different points of their life when you have different age children as well. Um, I was just talking to someone else and they were just like, when you have a newborn, it's very different. And I'm sure you can attest to having an eight-year-old or a, you know, a 15-year-old, a teenager as well. Um, and I want to kind of dive into as well, you mentioned you know, employees are are adults, you expect a salary for the job that you're working yeah. at, um, but you don't necessarily know what benefits to expect to. And I know you have a philosophy around the different purposes between salary and benefits. Can you walk yeah. us through what that looks like? Yeah, yeah, you've clearly read some of my blogs. Um, <laughs> so I, I do, I, I think that salary and benefits communicate completely different things. Uh, I think salary is about a transaction of work for dollars, right? I pay you this, you perform these actions. And if you perform well, you're going to get paid more. If you get perform poorly, you're either going to get paid less or you're going to get fired, right? It, it's okay. transactional. Um, and it, I think what a salary communicates is how valuable you are to the organization. Mm -hmm. Whereas benefits communicate something very different. Benefits communicate how much we care about you as an organization, right? As a person and your family and your life outside of work. So I think more and more so as we move into millennials and Gen Zs and future generations, we're more emotional people, if we're honest, right? It's much more about the relationship and does my employer represent what I care about? Are we on mission together, right? And am I cared about my about by my employer? And so in my mind, salary is actually becoming less important and benefits are becoming more important at an increasingly speedy rate um, over the last five years. And certainly, you know, with COVID and the empathy that thankfully has been built, I think, in many workplaces as a result of peering into each other's homes like we're doing now, Christina, um, I, I think benefits all the more um, are just becoming so central to how employees go about selecting who they work for and who they continue to work for and are loyal yeah. to. Yeah. Who they continue to work for, especially in this talent market as well. I was just reading about if companies don't offer flexible benefits, if they don't offer certain lifestyle benefits, it's just, you know, people have the opportunity to go to companies who are offering those things and are looking towards the future. Seeing the trends that you're mentioning as well, employees want to feel seen, heard, and listened to and have you know, have a company that cares about them as a person. Right. Um, in these conversations, oftentimes it comes up, how do you measure ROI or the effectiveness of your strategy? And I wanted to ask kind of in your experience, how do you measure the effectiveness of the lifestyle benefits offered at, at companies? Yeah, I think lifestyle benefits are probably a little bit too young mm -hmm. to measure retention quite yet. I think yeah. to be fair, I think it takes a solid three to five years to measure retention. And it's also incredibly complicated, right? Because there's so much that goes into why people leave companies. And sometimes actually nothing went wrong. They just needed to move on for some personal reason or they chose to stay home or, or whatever the case may be, right? So, so that's difficult to measure, but we're measuring it and we're gonna have more data as time goes on. Mm -hmm. However, on the recruiting side, on the talent attraction side, that is quite measurable and you can get those measurements earlier. Uh, and I think it comes down to your recruiting cost and your recruiting quality, right? So, and you get both when your people love your organization and when they're personally committed to your organization, they're gonna refer high quality people to come in that probably are gonna fit the culture because they're close trusted friends of your employees who you assume that they fit the culture because they already work for you, right? Um, and the talent pool that you're going to be tapped into, you, you're probably going to be able to win when you're offering X salary and the competitors offering the same salary 
but you've got a referral, right, from your employee that loves working there. That That is where I think things like lifestyle benefits and just cultural lifts in general are going to win the day, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that these top places to work, right, you top 100 in this city, top 50 in that city, all those lists, those are the cities that are turning into the most profitable companies in those cities as well, right? So I think it really just boils down to measuring the impact to your culture, measuring the impact to your recruiting. And then if you want to get real direct, measure the impact of bringing those lifestyle benefits into those recruiting conversations. And what is the acceptance rate before when you do that and when you don't do that, mm -hmm. right? Because it's no mistake that every job listing you see for Starbucks, for example, the first thing listed is free Spotify, right? Not health insurance for part-time employees, which is an incredible benefit for Starbucks employees, right? Very rare, but it's free Spotify, right? Which probably costs Starbucks absolutely nothing to offer, right? Um, but it, it's there's no mistake that these sort of lifestyle benefits make a huge difference on the recruiting side. Yeah, I actually have never noticed that within Starbucks job descriptions as well. But I think if it's listed as number one, that is definitely ranked in terms of, you know, what is catching people's eye as well. And what we're talking about too, in terms of lifestyle benefits and retention, attraction of talent, this all contributes to, to company culture at large. And when we're talking about retention, part of that is celebrating the wins, recognizing employees too. And I have a feeling I know kind of where you're gonna go with your answer this based on your uh, your previous uh, answer in our discussion, but what advice do you have for companies, leaders and managers to really ensure they are effectively celebrating their team, whether they are virtual first, hybrid, going to the office, um, you know, wherever employees are? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to recognition, it it's, it's a matter of making sure that you celebrate the wins, but to me that you also celebrate the effort, right? So one of the things in, in our organization that we talk about is that we want to fail boldly, right? Like when we mess up, we kind of want to, we kind of want to do it big and boldly, right? Because we were putting so much effort into something that we thought was the right way to go, sure. right? That we ended up kind of having a big snafu, right? I, I'm okay with it. And I think that's almost one of the big issues in, in the corporate world is that we only celebrate wins, mm -hmm. right? So when there's a loss, the tendency is to blame shift or to, I wasn't really a part of that project. That was mostly her. That was mostly him, right? Like that, that is one of the big issues. And I think prevents us from recognizing each other for each other's effort, right? So, so just as a conceptual piece. And then practically, I think recognition should be both monetary, should be both reward-based, yeah. but it also should be relational, right? So yeah. it's one thing to say, hey, congrats, you know, Christina, you did this incredible job on that podcast the other day. Like here's, you know, a hundred bucks that goes into whatever recognition platform you're using, right? Uh, but it's another thing altogether and that's public, but it's another thing altogether for your manager to send you a Slack message or to give you a call and say, hey, I know I know we said this thing publicly. Let me just tell you how it made me feel that you did such a great job yeah. and how that impacted my job and my life, right? That's that's deeper, that's even better, right? So, I mean, even though I, I'm the CEO of a company that has a platform and part of what we do is recognition and, and I wanna say it's very effective, it is, but nothing beats that one-on-one -on -one call out from a leader saying, hey, I just appreciate you. Yeah. You know, that's everything. Right. I think that goes back to that piece of like listening, hearing, and really seeing and valuing yes. employees too. I came from a kind of a sales organization as an account manager, and we would not only celebrate wins on Slack altogether, but it would really mean something when my VP or my manager would say, congratulations, like directly to me, whether it's in person or um, right. on a one-to-one -one level of Slack as well. And I think in terms of a holistic strategy for lifestyle benefits and just um, just in general too, I think a holistic approach is so important. It's not a one size fits all. And we know that, you know, not employees are going to be all happy all of the time. It's not the way life works. And especially over this last year, people are dealing with a lot as the person that they are with their caretakers or parents, um, isolating alone. There's just a lot of different 
factors and they can become disengaged over time. And I wanted to know kind of from your perspective, what is the role of a company, a team, or a manager to really re-engage a disengaged employee or how do you effectively, you know, get them back into uh, into that headspace? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I obviously every every answer has the um, precursor of it depends, right? So yeah. I, I don't want to be lame and say that, but I, but I think you do have to, from a managerial level, I think you do have to understand what's happening in a person's life, right? Not, you know, they may not give you every little detail and it may be kind of an invasion of their privacy to ask for every little detail, right? But sometimes that disengagement is just purely circumstance, right? It's just, <laughs> you know, something's just really not going okay. I mean, we, we had to reschedule this time, Christina, because my my daughter had 105 fever, right? And it was just, I was disengaged that day, right? There's not a single thing any manager or anybody else could have done about that, right? Um, and, and maybe that's something that's happening routinely. There's a real illness or there's, there's something really serious going on. Yeah. And, and that I think you have to give just ultimate flexibility. I think you have to be supportive. I think you just have to, to understand this is a time and a season where this person is going to be less engaged because they're prioritizing their family. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I think that you actually could build incredible loyalty with that person by being really understanding and giving them a, a long leash, right? But if the disengagement is more just you know, they're in meetings, they're showing up, they're kind of working a pretty normal schedule and they're around, but they're just not with it, right? They're, and they're just not their normal selves. Then I think that takes a different approach, right? I, I think in that case, it's like, hey, you seem to be here, right? You seem to be active in a sense that you're you're working and I see you and we, we slack a little bit, but you, you know, you don't really you're not the same, you know, like what's going on and like dig in because sometimes that can be a result of something interpersonal with the company, right? Mm -hmm. And then that, that's where it very much is our responsibility to figure that out. Maybe there's forgiveness that needs to happen, some reconciliation that needs to happen. Maybe a manager needs to apologize and that person is just too scared to say, actually, it was you that made me feel disengaged, right? Like that's a scary thing to say to a manager. So I think a lot of it is is listening, but also having a good deal of humility in the way that we approach the people that we lead so that they feel open and they can they can come to us with their issues, even if that issue is us, right, as leaders. I think that's probably the the biggest reason I see that people get disengaged is because there's a conflict, but they're too scared to bring it up. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're definitely right. Sometimes it's about you and other times it's not about you, but you're only right. going to know if you ask. If you ask, yeah. Uh, you ask for that context and you ask an employee as well. And I think it goes back to, I mean, what you just said in terms of asking questions, getting specific, not just how are you and expecting them to say good and like we're, you know, continue on with the day, actually right. asking specifically um, and having that one-on-one -on -one conversation and then listening. So if they say, you know, actually it is you, um, what are you going to do with that? Taking action um, and being yeah. empathetic. And again, what you said totally. in terms of leading with vulnerability and humility. And I wanted to ask from your perspective, from a macro company level, how do you really see that culture of employee listening and trust really manifesting at organizations that you partner with as well? Is there a difference between like people who are thinking intentionally about doing that um, as opposed to maybe having it as like a nice side effect? Yeah, you know, I think that sometimes it's too easy to just I don't know, kind of kind of give lip service to like understanding what people are going through, understand what people groups are going through, right? Um, or celebrating this month or that month or changing your logo to look a certain way to look like you're in the know. And, and that, yeah, that's great, you know, but like, is that really listening? Is that really supporting? Is, is there any depth to that, right? And one of the things I think about a lot is like, I don't want to be a mile wide and an inch deep on what we support and what we think about as an organization. Like, I want to know specifically about my people, right, that work for Fringe, that what are they going through? What do they care about? And that takes deep listening. And it also requires 
that I'm probably going to hear some things occasionally that are going to upset me or offend me, right? Like necessarily. And mm -hmm. I need to be able to do that for their sake because people aren't going to come into your organization and everyone just agrees. Like that's not how life works. If everyone agreed, then social media wouldn't be such a mess, right? Like and all the arguing and all the hate get, getting thrown around, right? We don't agree. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we don't listen is because we don't want to hear what people have to say. <laughs> right? like, and it seems obvious, right? But like, you can't listen if you're not willing to hear things you don't want to hear. So mm -hmm. I think it kind of goes back to that humility and, and putting other people first and saying, no, they need to be heard, right? And even though it might be a struggle for me to listen, I probably need to hear what they have to say, right? And ultimately, I'm going to benefit, they're going to benefit the whole organization is going to benefit, uh, but we can't expect it to be clean and neat and without conflict and without some painful aspects to that listening. Yeah, I was just speaking with someone the other day and conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing. Everybody has their own ideas, but it's, it's another form of communication and you work through it in a professional way, you work through it in a personal way, and it's something that's inevitable that will come up. So communication is really important and having that growth mindset also the vulnerability humility um and just that common ground with with a person or a team is important and if you fast forward to okay you get that feedback mistakes are bound to happen what do you do next other mistakes are bound to happen as well so my next question is a little bit more generally so um what are common mistakes you've seen companies make when they had the best intentions of creating their benefits plan but maybe it fell a little flat and they needed to readjust Mm. Yeah, you know, I think benefits benefits are often the kind of that benefit plan for organization is often created by a very small group of people, right? Mm -hmm. And so depending on kind of the diversity of that group of people that are in leadership, right? Do you have women in that group? Do you have people of color in that group? Do you do you have parents in that group? Do you have single people in that group? Empty nesters in that group, right? Like if not, then someone's voice wasn't heard, right? Um, and so just necessarily, you're either going to have to get more voices involved, which is probably the best way to do it, right? Or you've got to offer such personalization and such diverse options that you're going to catch everyone's desires and what everyone is looking for, right? So I think both would be great, right? Still, you want to listen, even if you're going to offer a great diversity of, of options for people, you still want to get the learnings out of, of hearing their voice. But ultimately, I, I know from experience, I know from my client's experience that what they're going to hear is 100 different people with about, you know, 90 different opinions at least, right? So in order to accommodate that, you're going to have to offer a great diversity of things to your people, right? right? I mean, th there's no other way to do that. So I think that one of the biggest, to answer your question really directly, I think the most common mistake is not offering enough, right? Um, I think it's important to bear in mind and kind of get hearkening back to recruiting. If you're trying to recruit millennials, you're trying to recruit Gen Zs, they, and I'm going to go back to Starbucks too, they walked into Starbucks when they were 15 years old in order to drink that required a 17 word description, right? To get exactly what they wanted, the non-fat, extra whip, what, oat milk, ups, exactly. Like that type of personalization is native to their experience of life, right? So in the marketplace, they get personalization. In the workplace, they walk in and people go, chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry, right? And it's just like, what decade are we in? <laughs> so I think there's just this mismatch that we think I can offer what I offered people 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, and it's still going to fly. It's just not, right? The pace of change in the world is much greater than that. Therefore, the pace of change in the benefit space has to follow suit, right? Um, so I, I think it's not modern enough, and I think it's not diverse enough. I think it's probably the two common mistakes. Absolutely. You want to ask folks, you want to understand where they are in the different stages of their life. And also for the people who are making those decisions too, make sure that you have a diversity of voices there too. And I really like that menu of options. Again, the Starbucks example, very relevant yeah. uh, to what's happening today. And I think even in the world of 
people, HR, and just companies in general. There's so much room for innovation as we're building this more equitable workplace and also thinking about, again, virtual first, hybrid, or back to the office, whatever that looks like in terms of design. There's so much opportunity for innovation. Are there any other trends that you're seeing uh, in companies that you work with and at Fringe that individuals, managers, or just people in general need to be aware of and hone in on to be successful in the future? Any kind of advice there? Yeah, I think there's I think there's quite a few things that are trending, right? Uh, I think one is the is the hybrid workforce idea, right? Um, I don't mind sharing. I have a very firm opinion on it. Um, I may not be right, but I have an opinion. And that opinion is that we ought to let people work from wherever they like. Yeah. Um, I don't think that means that it's unwise to have a space for people. I actually think both is good. Um, some people, it's very productive, very much part, like helpful in their life. Maybe they're a single parent and maybe their kids still aren't back to school yet, which means they're at home every day. How in the world are they going to go to an office? Like, it's just not going to happen. Or maybe they're not a single parent, but both parties work, right? That's not conducive. But for me personally, and there's plenty of people in my boat, we have four children. So my wife is home full time with them and I'm working full time. I don't need to be here in the closet of my bedroom working. I can leave. Like she's got it locked down, right? I want to be here a couple of days a week. I want to see them. I want to be, you know, have those special times, but I also want to get away and have a space. And so to me, provide both, right? So that, that's my opinion, but, but that's a trend that, you know, we're heading for a collision course. I read yesterday, 83% of CEOs want people to return back to the office. Less than 10% of employees want to come back full time right? 83 versus 10, like something's got to give, right? Yeah. Um, and so to me, I, you know, I think it's a mistake to require people to come back in any at all, like even one day a week. I think it's a mistake. I think it's going to backfire. I think people are going to leave and go find flexibility elsewhere. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing, the other trend that's quite obvious, you know, is trying to help with mental health for folks, right? Uh, with burnout. And, and some of that's related to working from home, but a lot of it's just related to being in a pandemic, right? Because it's not like we stopped seeing our coworkers. We also stopped seeing our families and yeah. we stopped <laughs> having little like chit chat conversations at the grocery store. And we stopped going on dates with our significant other. And that's the reason, that's also the reason for the burnout. It's not just Zoom, right? Yeah. We talk about Zoom fatigue. <laughs> Sure, that's part of it. But like, I think we also are just lonely, right? I think it's what it boils down to. Um, so I, I think mental health is, is a big one. And I think where we, what we probably need to realize there is that, again, we've hired adults, right? So we need to give them tools and we need to encourage and we need to do whatever training we can and we need to be flexible. But ultimately, as adults, like we need to be responsible for our own mental health, right? So if we need to work less or we need to get off of Zoom more or we need to talk to a counselor, we're just gonna have to make that decisions, those decisions ourselves. Um, so I think sometimes we, we, we're, we overemphasize like we need to solve mental health for our people. Like, no, we need to give them the tools to yeah. solve mental health, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's actually not a company's job. It, like that's, that if you were dealing with children, it would be, right? But, but these are adults. Um, what other trend? I had another one in mind and then I've talked myself into uh, a hole here. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot that's changing, right? It's just so much that's changing right now. And, you know, to your point earlier, I, I, think, I think the best thing we could do, especially in 2021, is just listen as much as humanly possible because... The world is changing really, really fast, and we need to understand how our people are doing so that we can provide the best work situation we possibly can for them. Absolutely. I think that is 100% correct in terms of empathetic listening, actively listening, getting specific and intentional about the spaces that you're holding for those conversations, and then offering just you know that menu of options for mental health, for flexibility, for whatever that means to 
employees and just have that conversation again two-way conversation not just someone talking at you or just like you talking at employees I think it's it's really important it's a really exciting time in the workplace but it's also really you know there's still so much uncertainty and you know nobody has I wish that they did all of the answers but you can start with trying and having that having that discussion totally absolutely yeah. Is there anything else that you kind of wanted to share as like a key takeaway or just like a point you yeah. want to reemphasize anything that I didn't ask that you want to share? Yeah. I, I just want to, if there's any fellow CEOs listening, I, I just want to shout out for our HR leaders mm-hmm. in, in the world. Our, our HR leaders historically, I think have been way too close to order takers and way not close enough to real leaders having real voices in the organization. And that is changing, but it needs to change way faster. So to speak to the CEOs, listen to your chief people officer, listen to your head of HR, listen to your benefits people. They know way better than you do what your people are going through and what they need. And they're not just a cost center. They're those, those HR folks, those leaders, are essential to who you hire and what your culture looks like. And I'm telling you, within the next decade, the top 100 places to work and the Fortune 100 list will be the same list because mm-hmm. it's all about culture moving forward. Um, so that that would be my one opportunity to just, you know, just call out the CEOs like, hey, like put I your understand. put your pride down and listen. Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. And something that we're hearing in, in the market today as well. People, HR, diversity, equity, and inclusion teams are just, they're on the, the front lines and everybody's going to them for answers as well in terms of company culture. So it's important to invest time, money, and resources. And just, again, interpersonal relationships are so important. Jordan, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture. I really enjoyed speaking with you. I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much, Christina. Yes, absolutely. And as a reminder for folks who are listening, all voices please in the empowerment of everyone to speak up. And we think it's a requirement uh, for the company to succeed. We'll speak soon. Have a good rest of your afternoon.